Um, so I wanted to create this um, session because uh, there's been talk about systems change in fashion for for years now, for several years, especially the last couple of years. And, um, you know, I don't necessarily have the solution. I have the research. It's, you know, I want us to just have a conversation around this because we're going through these extraordinary times, very difficult times. And, um, Many businesses are, go, are, you know, going bankrupt, people are getting laid off. This is really serious, serious stuff. So uh, when I talk about systems changes, you know, with deep consideration for everything that's going on and what's facing us, you know, in the, in the near future. But with, with that, when business does go back to normal, there's an opportunity also to review and hopefully change certain things and have an open conversation. Um, and I think we need to kind of regain our power and realize that even if we may not be the top executive in, in, you know, in our companies, that we have the power to make change and that it starts with, with us. So um, just to do a bit of uh, house cleaning before we start the session, um make sure if you don't want to be heard to unmute yourself if you want to be seen press the video especially if you're speaking because this is an open floor and i will engage with others to speak so you can as you can see on the right hand side of your screen you have uh, buttons where you can mute or turn on your video um and also uh when you do speak try to keep it to like two or three minutes because uh, we, you know, we want to be able to include as, as many people as possible. And the way I'm doing this session today is a little bit different from last time. I'm sort of like improvising and testing different things because this is a very new format that I just kind of started two weeks ago in the midst of this crisis. Uh, but basically today I thought, well, rather than jump straight into questions, which can also be, I find oftentimes even with my students a bit intimidating, maybe I would just give you a quick uh, slideshow of different, you know, real overview of a few things I've shown at presentations recently, just to give you some like food for thought, get your juices going, and then we can jump into questions. And then I'd love the last 10 minutes of the session if we can um, do some exercises to get you going and, and get you out of the session with more things to, to think about. So um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, let me uh, do this. So. And I can see people are still rolling in, so I'm gonna have to share it like this. And hold on and share. Sorry, I'm new to this, so I'm trying to share. Okay, share. All right. So um, today, how would you change the current fashion system? Um, oops, I am having a little uh, issue. So um, I just wanted to share this slide to give you an idea of some of the tensions that we have right now uh, with our current system. And um, basically, I think, you know, we have to really come to terms with the tensions that we have right now between trying to be climate positive, trying to really face some of the positive solutions and not go through a doomsday scenario about the planet, but also notions of collapsology, which is basically our climate and, and uh, planet collapsing. Uh, we're also facing tension between digital automation, uh, you know, just everything going digital. 
uh, and also how that redefines artisanship and craft. Um, industrial efficiency, are we, have we truly been efficient? And the tension with nature's genius and really harnessing biomimicry. I've talked about this, you know, this idea that clothing could not just be sewn, it could be grown as well. Uh, the tension between businesses and government, um, basically businesses are going to have to step in, in some cases and bail out government. What are the ethical implications of this? And now with the coronavirus, we're seeing major issues around privacy and a type of uh, surveillance, potentially uh, system that we might be entering. Uh, we're also looking at the tension between global collaboration and scarcity. We need to collaborate. If anything, this crisis is showing us how global, global collaboration is, is key, but we're also facing scarcity and po probably having to rely more on our local economies. Um, we're facing economic collapse and also the need to create a real society where we have social support, where we can have healthcare for all, where we can have a universal base income probably. And we're looking at a change in what capitalism mean with still a tension between profit margin gods, corporations, and not that corporations are necessarily a bad thing, but you know, corporations putting profit before planet and a future that is truly human and in the benefit of all. So in a, so some, some of the organization that are really trying to change things starts with the manifesto. We have like do, do the green thing, which has created creativity versus climate change uh, manifesto. And just to, I'm not sure if you can see the screen well, but they say as creative thinkers, makers, and doers, we know that a keep cup won't save the planet. We need to do so much more. We can start by telling everyone the trouble we're in. We can disrupt business as usual. Um, we can challenge the status quo and change the story. We can create a space for connection and dialogue, for originality, for joyful curiosity. And then to the right, you have Nomos of the Earth, which um, which also propones acting in the real and acting in real time. I still have people coming in and I'm trying to see how I can admit them all. Ah, sorry, I'm having a problem, little technical issue here. Um, let me just admit all. Um, so can you guys just uh, see? Uh, so uh, I am having some, okay. So can you guys all see my screen? I'm still new to Zoom, so I just wanna see, or can you see my uh, presentation? Okay, yeah, great, okay, sorry about that. Um, so basically what I want to, to give you, what I give you is basically some, some information about uh, where you could go with this and really, where you could look for inspiration in terms of creating a manifesto, but we are deeply under pressure. There's, a, you know, we're talking about the death of clothing, Bloomberg Business publishing this article recently in rela relationship to brick and mortar retail. Recently, Vogue Business talked about all the forced cancellations that are jumpstarting virtual fashion technology because of the COVID virus. Last year, we had the creation of the Fashion Pact during the G7, so we're seeing a lot of um, coalitions coming up. Not saying that the fashion pact is necessarily the best solution, but it is one of the big solutions. You also have the UN Fashion Alliance, you have many different alliances that are coming together across fashion industry trying to come up with a solution. And you have, for example, Copenhagen Fashion Week, looking at Fashion Week more as a hub for innovation. Um, and then we have also, uh, you know, young creative professionals that are really looking to disrupt. This is an article from, uh, it's nice that called the climate crisis is daunting, but as creative professionals, there's much you can do. And it's true, we can change our working culture. We can rightly ask ourselves, uh, you know, how we can draw a policy for the future. It obviously, 
stems from, you know, looking at current systems, but it also stems from um, really looking at what alliances you can make, what organizations you can follow, and really informing yourself. So here's a slide just about a few concepts to get you started. So you have the new climate economy, which um, is a global commission on the economy and climate. And it's a major international organization that is led by formal, former government leaders, policymakers, and um, it's, it has some really interesting reports. I highly recommend you take a look at it. Also, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, this is probably one of my favorite, it has a huge amount of reports. This is a system that is already in place. New Zealand is following it, um, Iceland, Scotland. In fact, uh, Scotland's um, the head of the government has a great talk, TED talk about it that you'll find on the website. We also have obviously, which is not on the slide, the circular economy model, which is based on the principles of designing out waste and pollution and keeping products and materials constantly in reuse and really creating a regenerative system. And then um, we have obviously degrowth, which is a concept that started in the 70s. Actually, my dad used to, I didn't know this, he used to um, be an activist and demonstrate around degrowth. But um, now it's kind of getting a second wind. And there are some critics of the degrowth system, but I highly uh, recommend you look up all of, the, all of the literature on this online, including the Wikipedia page for the degrowth system, which is really good. Um, and then obviously we have rental systems co coming up, the secondary uh, economy, the se secondary fashion ranging from vintage to to uh, recycled fashion, redesigned fashion, everything is starting to really gain momentum. So um, many of the models that require a well-being economy or models like the degrowth system would require some type of universal base income and have certain challenges, even for example, for women, because women's lib has also come with capitalism and the fact that they have been able to create income for themselves. So with everything, we have to question um, the system. And, and this is why scenario planning and speculative thinking, which is something we talked about in the last session, is really important to just kind of play out these different scenarios. Um, so another uh, conference I highly recommend you uh, watch, it was for free and it was live streamed from New York. It's a study halls sustainability conference that happened earlier this year. And it's about five hours long, but it's broken down into many talks with amazing people from uh, a real diverse set of people, very inclusive conference in terms of uh, ethnicity, in terms of people's uh, roles. And uh, I highly recommend you look at this because essentially, um, you know, fighting for climate change and social justice does not mean fighting capitalism and economic growth. We just need to redefine what economic growth uh, means for the fashion industry. So that's kind of my intro. I'm going to um, turn the screen sharing off and open the floor for, um, for questions. So uh, let's see, how do I do this? Stop sharing. I'm back. OK. <laughs> um, so anybody, um, I have already some questions lined up uh, that were sent by um, Deborah. But if you have questions, uh, start start sending them. Otherwise, I'll start with Deborah, as uh, she was the first one to send questions earlier today. So, um, Deborah had some really interesting points that we've all thought about, which is the rhythm of seasonal collections and the fact that the entire industry is uh, grounded in this seasonal model, which means going all the way back to the trade shows. Uh, to when we source our fabrics. The fact that we deliver collections on a seasonal basis forces us into a system of overconsumption and really over uh, exhaustion of resources in the planet. So um, um, 
Deborah just asked, you know, she thinks that we should forego uh, the seasonal model and look more into uh, may maybe uh, creating collections that have standard basics and then certain inclusions of capsules possibly here and here and there and just rethink the whole model of fabric exhibitions and uh, fabric fairs as in the way that they exist today. And with the fact that now we're looking at a, an industry that has come to a halt, there is a possibility that some of this might already be happening, not necessarily by choice, but by necessity. So I'm just wondering what some of you might have to say to, to Deborah, because I'm not obviously in accordance to her. And uh, we have like several experts, inclu including Maria from Fashion Roundtable, Belle, an amazing journalist, Belle Jacobs. We have, and all of you, some of you I have never met before, but uh, what are your thoughts on the seasonal model and how this could change? Uh, if anyone wants to be unmuted, let me know. So um, if no one, I'll just continue. Um, Deborah had more questions. So the fact also of the size of the collections, them being too too big. Um, and so that's something that potentially we will need to, to reconsider as well. Um, so how, how do we do this when we're pressured by, you know, uh, mer you know the merchandise, the whole system has been based on really large collections. So how as designers, merchandisers, buyers, do we come together to agree that we don't need such huge collections? Uh, because I think when we go back to work with our teams, we need to all schedule time for these types of sessions with our team. And we have to recognize the fact that the COVID-19 crisis is directly linked to climate change. It's not just the spread of a virus. This is climate change in real time. And this is what we are facing if we don't urgently change our ways. Um, so I think there's opportunity right now as we reflect and we're all home to, you know, start brainstorming on these things. And rather than when the time is allocated to, uh, you know, to design the next collection, why not instead allocate some time to discuss these discuss these things and really look at the costs. Bell, yes, you have something to say. I'm going to unmute. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm being too helpful, but I think I think the and I'm going to link fashion shows and trends. I think they are being challenged, and I don't know if it's because I'm reading certain types of media, but the whole sort of cyclical system of um, fashion is being questioned as as news about the climate emergency you know gets worse and and as fashion's relation to the climate emergency becomes clearer so i don't know um obviously stockholm cancelled copenhagen copenhagen fashion stockholm cancelled fashion week cancelled copenhagen completely restructured and i think there was one uh, fashion week, quite small, and it, it was happening with the smaller ones as well because they, they're a little bit more nimble. But Lisbon, I think, had a whole um, event just dedicated to what fashion would represent in a world um, where we need to answer necessities rather than luxuries. And when I say luxury, I don't mean um, beautifully made clothes. I mean the luxury of excess. Yeah. Um, and and so, so I think I think it is happening incrementally. I actually um, think the consumers need to push the brand. So as the consumers become more aware of the climate emergency and fashion's role, I think consumers will be asking for more. And I think also that is kind of happening now. Um, so I'm actually very hopeful. I'm not saying that we should all sit back on our laurels and go that's sorted then. But the whole thing about, you know, if we, if we explain, if, if we make clear to people, the whole thing about trends and fashion shows is to drive consumption, is to drive the production of collections that are m far more huge than we will ever need. Um, then I think people will start to understand that that has to, that whole way of living and expecting has to end. Yeah, yeah. 
I think uh, we all know this and now we need to take action. I think there's no sense I mean, not that we can do it necessarily overnight, but maybe with this crisis, which is such a shock to the system, we, it's a good opportunity to put everything on the table. And, uh, and, and this is why also I'm doing these sessions because I just feel like we're turning around in circles and, and something has to, has to happen. These, these are our lives, you know, we're not a happy people, we're not a happy planet at the moment, and things don't have to be this way. And as an industry, and the second biggest believing industry in the world, we, we have huge responsibilities. So um, I'm seeing a number of questions come in, you know, in terms of even marketing. Holly was saying that, you know, in terms of marketing new collections, there's opportunity to mark to do exciting things with archives or very small collections or I think in terms of those who work on the marketing side of fashion there's a great opportunity to rewrite the story of what fashion can be you know and uh, and and fashion is about mystique fashion is emotion fashion is is everything of how we you know relate to our bodies and our physicality and our beauty and the image we want to represent to the world and there are other ways of expressing that than feeding into these seasonal trends and seasonal you know collections and you know this is for my next talk but you know there's a wonderful opportunity to really reclaim creativity here and and self-expression and, and originality, I think. So, um, so I'm just looking through questions. Yeah, like we're saying, hello everyone. Does this mean that fashion trade shows, fairs would be finished or they can work as online events and structures? I mean, um, Deborah had an interesting idea, which was that, um, you know, rethink fashion fairs as something where they can be also about reusing uh, dead stock or existing stock or, you know, having more trade shows around that. And, uh, and, 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 and I think also there's maybe opportunity to kind of do an audit of the planet. When you look at um, organizations like uh, Global Footprint Network who uh, do overshoot day, Earth overshoot day, what if there's a way of looking at actually the budgeting of how much materials we can extract from the planet in one year? What is, I mean, we all live within a budget, right? We all have a budget, which is so messed up, by the way, right now. Um, you know, but we all work within a budget. We need to do that for the planet as well. And 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 maybe there is a time of, of rationing that could come forward. But I don't know that it would make tremendous you difference. Deborah was, was also talking about um, you know, the idea of more basics and maybe there's opportunity to go today. So, um, um, Giselle, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, anybody else want, want to add to this? Cause I'm just going on and on and I could go on and on, but, um, these are, uh, some of the things, I mean, um, with the fashion trade shows, I think that's something to, to, to really, Giselle, did you want to, to speak? Um, some of the things, I mean, um, um, yes, the fashion trade shows, I think that's something to, to, to really, Giselle, did you want to, to speak? No, I, I just wanted to add that, um, there is, um, yesterday, um, yes. There was this um, this conversation in between the Brazilian industry yeah. members. So there was a, a session in the Zoom as well, and we were discussing what's going to be next. And uh, we do believe that there will be a movement towards our DNA, which is crafts. You know, so there's a movement of made in Brazil and also, you know, crafted pieces so that 
people are not we don't believe that people are going to to go crazy after this uh, crisis stop and then go out consuming again because we'll we'll be in a tight budget so we will have to 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 buy basics first but as long as we want to to buy something different to wear it has to be timeless and it has to be precious you know handmade and uh, things that we haven't uh, given so much importance in the last few years yeah. so this is what uh, the 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 short for for what i heard from from uh, my colleagues in the industry just to specify uh brazil um Chazelle is 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 uh, coming in from from brazil so um that's really exciting to have you um and you're an expert in supply fabrics can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Oh, I think I've lost her. But um, I just wanted to um, to say that uh, it is a definitely a great opportunity to appreciate mm -hmm. crafts. What I do I is actually... I think we have a bit of a delay, Giselle. I think I'm having problems with the, with, with the sound, so... If you could just quickly tell us about what you do so that um, the group understands why, what your expertise is in, in terms of supply chain. Because with, with the sound, so. If you could just quickly tell us about what you do so that um, the group understands why, what your expertise is in, in terms of supply chain. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the what i do is like uh, i develop fabrics for the textile industry in brazil you know i've been um, a textile designer for many years and uh, i work for companies in china and in brazil okay, so great. the chinese people are uh, supplying uh, fashion brands in europe and also in 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 south america Right. And uh, so actually when I'm doing a collection for Brazil, I, I am also doing something else for the Northern Hem Hemisphere. So now, you know, I, uh, China has started to work. So actually, you know, uh, what we are doing is like facing all this situation. We are trying to make a collection that has sustainability in its um, right. DNA and also different... Um, a different approach you know okay. towards the the collections as well thank you i'm just gonna you now thank, thank you Giselle. um i just wanted to also look um take into consideration um yusra's uh comment about uniqueness and how important it is for a lot of consumers and how you know in changing our system we could still address that need to be original and unique through you know through craft through remaking through reuse and i think in terms of marketing and collections that there's a wonderful opportunity there to to really engage with with the the end consumer so the question is how will that draw currency you know and that's where that's the crux of the of the of the problem is how, how do you draw profit from this so what defines profit now is def is defining profit money and coins or is it a different type of profit and this is where things like the well-being economy and the degrowth system come into play because we can talk forever about reuse and marketing and telling things differently and stopping seasonal collections at the bottom of it we need a roof over our heads we need food and all these things we buy with money and brands at this stage need to make money and they need to continue making money and we're facing a global crisis even in terms of brands right now who are not even paying their suppliers in bangladesh we think we have it bad. There are millions of people currently in Bangladesh facing a humanitarian crisis. So, you know, when we talk about reducing our consumption, there's a big responsibility towards that, even towards other countries whom we've, you know, we've been employing. 
So it's a global cooperation. There are huge implications, but um, uh, you know, I, I just think that there's there's a, so much to discuss here. So we have about ten minutes left, but I just wanted to bring something else up which is that, um, and this is something that Kura, if you're here, you might be able to also uh, participate in, but Kura is a blogger. Hi, Kura. And um, you- Hi. Hi. And uh, you, she works with many emerging designers. She's a blogger with a, a really large following, uh, covers all the, a lot of the catwalk shows, mainly emerging designers and has a direct, line of communication with them, Cora from France. And um, just tell us a little bit about the conversations you've been having with the younger designers that, that you've been, um, you know, you've been um, talking to. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. And I hope everybody- Say if you can just do it for two minutes because we're gonna run out of time. Yeah, well. yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'm going to be very quick. So uh, basically, all the emerging designers are thinking about other ways to showcase their collection. Oh, do you, are you? Yeah, are we you, all hear you. Me? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, and um, I'd like they're thinking about other ways to showcase collection because uh, fashion show week seems to be very irrelevant for now and it's wasting too much time and too much energy and it requires to gather too many people in the in a short time and all the flights etc is too much and uh, emerging designer are like they are more into showrooms like you said before uh, trade shows but I really think for the next few generation uh, in fashion, like for the future of fashion, I really think we need to get rid of the established fashion designer, like, you know, like the big brand, I think they are not relevant. It's only my opinion for me, but I don't think they are relevant in this whole like situation because they are wasting too much money and too much um, fabrics and too much energy, kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think also like, um, I don't know what you think, Cora, and everyone else, but I think, you know, it's when you look at the situation on a macro level and, and uh, the fact that we're really ripe for a big change, but even if you look at it on a very personal level, I know so many designers that are unhappy. Yes. And just let's keep it real. Let's have a real conversation about how we feel, you know, on a personal level. It's all great trying to change systems, but we also, it has to start yeah. with how we feel. And so many designers feel like just squeezed, squeezed out of their creativity because of this model that we're in. And um, yes. so I think, I think when we talk about sustainability, it's not just materials, it's about the workers, and the well-being, it's all about the well-being of the planet and the well-being of the people. And I'm sorry, but not even just the, the garment workers that aren't always fairly treated. Let's look at the, the teams, internal brand teams. You know, I'm not making a blanket comment. There are wonderful teams out there. But there are also a lot of people, especially in the fast-paced, fast fashion environment that are really unhappy. I know quite a lot of people who literally just quit their jobs and just were desperate to get out because of this incessant cycle. So it's, it's, it's makes sense for the planet, but it also makes sense for us on a very personal level. Um, yes. I, yeah. I feel, I just feel like they are more like legit when it comes to, to the new generation of fashion, et cetera, because their philosophy is more sustainable and more about like um, spread a, a real message um, besides like they have something to say. And I feel like established brands just need, like just want to take advantage of all the trends and all the, the social issues that occurring in our society, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Cora. I'm just gonna mute you now. Because I'm going to try to jump to the next thing really quickly before we finish. 
thanks everyone. I see the chat and I see you all, all exchanging. And if any of you want to connect with specific people in the chat, please, please let me know and I will make the introduction uh, because I have everyone's uh, emails. Um, so I just, I'm gonna screen, share my screen again. Um, okay, let's do this. Oh. Um, so, um, can you see the screen? <laughs> I hope you can. So, uh, so, okay. So when we talk about systems change, some of what we need to do is think about the future and project ourselves into the future. And my last session, we talked about speculative design. Um, here I want to look at a few very introductory tools that obviously I'm sure some of you know many great techniques, probably you have other suggestions, but in terms of scenario planning, often when we look at scenarios, we look at the plausible, the, you know, the probable, which is the near term future, the, the plausible, which is a little bit after, and then um, the uh, preferable. Preferable is, is, is generally what's used for far scenarios because um, basically we have to, you know, envision what the future might be. So people often lean on the idea that to envision the future, we should look at a preferable future, but that obviously isn't a blanket statement. To envision also the future, we should look at the dangers of certain far-term scenarios, et cetera. Um, so these are just a few examples to get you going. The Strategic Planning Cone by Amy Webb. Um, also, Fashion Futures 2030 is a really great tool. It's a downloadable resource with four different scenarios for the future. And um, this wonderful book called Design is Storytelling by Ellen Lupton is basically about uh, speculative design. It's a nice little book and I love the way she talks about the wild cards of the future. And uh, you could say that COVID-19 is kind of a wild card uh, or Brexit or Trump or you know other things like this. So um, I'm gonna leave you with this. But also there are other companies like PCH Innovations that use a system called the Labyrinth. So maybe your scenario plan is a type of mind map. Maybe it's a free thinking tool. Maybe it's a drawing. Uh, you know, be creative in terms of uh, a, the series of branches and lines that the future may take when you think about systems change. Um, so, these are, there's not a set true path for the future. It's not like you can exactly predict the future, but in terms of systems change, you can scenario plan and see, test out different types of systems. For example, if you look at the degrowth system, how may that work for the fashion um, world? And also when you go back and work in your teams to actually make these, turn these things into actionable, uh, tools, what type of scenario planning meeting could you schedule with your team? What type of um, discussion could you have around this? And what type of brainstorm? So I highly recommend you uh, educate yourself on this. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is just a quick exercise. So I don't know if you all got my email on Eventbrite or if you saw this on the Eventbrite invitation, but I wanted you guys to take an A4 sheet. I'm just gonna show it also to everyone on Instagram. Um, so just draw six, six, no, sorry, seven bubbles. Um, and this is inspired by the trend ecosystem that, I, that I've been using since 2013. So draw seven bubbles. And this is really a quick fire exercise, okay? Like, um, nothing fancy, you don't have to have like the perfect answer. So draw six bubbles, six connected. They look a little bit like say, you know, molecular structures. And then what I want you to do is for each bubble where you see a specific, um, a specific area that impacts our industry. And again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I tried to, to use everything that I could. Um, put a word, 
put a, an emotion, put a quick word. This is a quick fire two minute exercise. So for example, this is a scenario for 2023. So this is in three years. Where do you think we might be in terms of socioeconomic and world affairs? Uh, where do you think we might be in terms of retail or direct to consumers, in terms of craft design and materials, workforce and wellness? Um, that means, you know, the, the way our, our work will be structured, the way our teams will be structured, supply chain and manufacturing, art and culture, tech and science. I don't mention things like sustainability or going digital because to me they're a given. They're underpinning everything. So um, just, just to specify this. So if you just want to take, uh, put quick fire words. Everyone okay? I'm gonna go to the next. Okay, so now what I want you to do, and this is something you can continue after the meeting, you know, you don't have to finish now, but just reflect on the personal and collective values that you've looked, that you've possibly written or the collective, the personal and collective values that your words reflect and how they're affected positively and negatively by the plausible ecosystem of 2023. And um, this is something, this, this sentence is actually taken from the workshop. I mean, I, 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 you know, I tweaked it to, to personalize it, but this is inspired by the 2030 futures um, scenario by, uh, that I mentioned before. So look again, if you want also a full workshop format that you would like to test out with your teams, you can go to Fashion Futures 2030. So just reflect, you know, again, this is really quick fire words. Um, and sometimes the best ideas come out of these quick fire exercises. Okay, so this is your plausible future. Our next future has the same words, the same paradigms, the, the same words in the molecules, these circles I call molecules in my course. And, but this is for 2028. And I chose 2028, it might sound a bit random, but that's because Instagram started in 2012. That was only eight years ago, and we know how much this has changed our lives and the industry, but think about it. It was only eight years ago. How crazy is this? So think about like what could happen in eight years. Um, don't tell me that some radical things may not happen. They will. Some radical things will happen. So, um, so this is your preferable future, okay? So this is where you can utilize what we call blue sky thinking and think the impossible. And this is where, you know, you could also tap into science fiction writing in the future. When you look at things like this, you could tap into um, uh, techniques for hacks as well as design sprints. Um, and these are techniques where you have very limited time and you're forced to come up with ideas really fast. And oftentimes, some, some of the best designs come that way as well. And this is, these are techniques we could really embrace in fashion that are generally used uh, in tech, in software design, and in, in, in UI, UX design. So I, everybody has uh, written down what they think. Yeah? OK, I'm going to move on. We're almost there, we're almost finished. Thanks everyone so much for your time. So I'm not sure what your charts look like, what your ecosystems look like, but was there a massive gap for you? Or, and if there was, is there a way to bridge that gap between your near future and your far future? 
and you know ask yourself what is needed to change the ecosystem and i would say you know think think big but also really look at frameworks such as um ec economic models uh that that sort of thing will really give a structure to how you can turn a big idea even possibly something that might come across as a dream and impossible into something that you can really take action i forgot to mention also a uh, martin raymond's book uh the trend forecasters handbook which uh its second edition came out last fall and talks a lot about scenario planning uh so you can research that term uh, but again i would really look to i would lean on organizations such as the well-being economy uh, the global footprint network lean on organizations such as the fashion roundtable maria is here today i think she's joining us this is an amazing agency based out of london which is working very hard to change policies um, towards a towards a more sustainable fashion uh, system so i'm going to leave you with this and i'm going to end my screen but if you want to find out about my next events just go to geraldinewari.com and go to school and that's kind of where i'm publishing things or if you're not signed up for my newsletter or sign up i'll do my best not to spam you although i am like scheduling these uh things like once a week so I will inevitably, at this stage right now, whilst I'm bouncing off the walls of my apartment, email you every week. Um, and yeah, it would be amazing if you want to take a, a shot, if you feel like sharing on social media, uh, whatever you've done on your ecosystems, um, it would be amazing. So I'm going to end my screen sharing. How do I do this? Um, stop sharing. So, um, I was wondering if, uh, thank you everybody, I'm just seeing this. I was wondering if, Maria, are you still there? She might be gone. We had Maria from um, the Fashion Roundtable and I thought she could tell you a little bit more. But one final question that came up was like, how do you embrace a more sustainable system? And I also recommend you go on commonobjective.com and they currently have, just today I got an email that their whole professional membership will be free until July. There's a, a lot of resources there as well. So um, I may not have covered all of the questions, but I'm going to save the chat and try to cover everything in the next session. But thank you everyone for, for contributing. And is there anyone who would like to add anything else before we leave? No? Great, it's the evening, it's late for some of you, it's earlier for some other ones. So have, have a great rest of the day and I'll be in touch with for the next session. Thank you.